This is Amateur Logic, episode 192, for April 12th, 2024. Amateur Logic is brought to you by ICOM. Put a spring in your step with ICOM. Get outside this spring and work out the kinks in your station. ICOM has the radio for you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. Emilio. And Mike. And Mike has, is that in with Intel nerd inside? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I believe that. You resemble that remark, Mike? I do. <laughs> well, we have a full show tonight. You know, this has been... A really unusual week here, wouldn't you say, Tommy? It very it has very much. Well, we had an eclipse after uh, some really bad storms that some of us are still recovering from. Emil, you just like got electricity. <laughs> yeah, just... like two a.m. this morning, we got internet and uh, power back from that uh, F two. Uh, EF2 tornado that passed less than a mile away from the house, guys. When less is that? How long was wow. it out? Uh, two days. Wow. And uh, we felt it. We felt the pressure change. We It was uh, about 120 mile an hour winds. And uh, me and my son's uh, wife, we, uh, we ran for cover at our houses. So not fun, but hey, we survived and uh, we're pulling through. Wow. Tommy. I've uh, just been trying to keep it together, man. Like you said, it's been a crazy week. Uh, somebody turned off the sun Monday in the middle of the day. Yeah. And uh, everything just kind of went downhill from there. So were you able to see any eclipse? Yeah, actually, I was. I, actually, I've got a video. I, oh, me, do you? Me, yeah, hold on. Let me let me get it together. Go go to everybody and then come back to me. All right, email. Uh, well, we kind of heard, but there's probably more going on than that's that's plenty. If you don't have anything else, that's plenty. Yeah, that's plenty. But yeah, we got this. It was uh, it was cloudy here for the eclipse. Overcast. Mm -hmm. We didn't. I didn't see uh, anything. There was no break or anything in the sun. So uh, even the uh, solar eclipses now are being outsourced to the cloud. George. Oh well. Yep. <laughs> Mike, were you able to see anything up there? No, as as usual, whenever there's some sort of celestial event, uh, it's always overcast. Although it got really dark, we were kind of not in the arc, but just north of the arc. We did see it, but we didn't see it. We saw the the effects of the eclipse with the uh, the the blocking of the sunlight. This is uh, this is about two and a half hours of eclipse, rainy day eclipse. Notice all the squirrels running around the yards here. <laughs> I didn't notice the time-lapse squirrels, Tommy. See, you can see this. It looks like hundreds of them. But it, uh, <laughs> that's what the eclipse looks like. That's my eclipse tree. Nice. And that, is cool. that was pretty much the extent of it. FedEx was in a hurry there, man. Yeah. Somebody, <laughs> somebody turned off the sun and it turned it back on a little bit later. Wow. I wanted to do some radio-related eclipse stuff this time around. I've done it before. The past eclipse uh, last year, I, I didn't have any luck at all doing anything radio-wise. The, um, the eclipse before that, several years before that, I was able to pick up a radio station, an uh, AM broadcast station in Little Rock that normally you couldn't pick up during the day here, but when it eclipsed, it came on in. So, And I showed that. I don't know if it was on Amateur Logic or Ham Nation, one or the other. This time I decided to step it up a little bit. You know, I've got the, um, the RSP Duo SDR Play um, little software defined radio plugged in my computer and it's got a nice am receiver on it i use the sdr uno software uh email's got that too tommy's got that mike i don't know if you have that or not i just have the uh the sdr or what is it the uh the 1a oh uh, same same software the same and everything. kind of deal but only yeah. one receiver yeah 
I'm, let me just tell you, there's not a lot you can do with two receivers. At least I have not found yet that there's a lot I can do with mm-hmm. it. Well, I thought I thought doing the diversity thing would would be kind of interesting, but uh... it can help. I, I have seen sometimes that the diversity actually does help uh, to reduce noises. What I've used that for, so yeah, that can be handy. Anyway. So I was going to use it. Now, I, I live in town here, and the noise level in our city has come up substantially over the last few years. To it wasn't me. I wasn't even here. Yeah, it, it's... You are now, though. <laughs> That's true. But anyway, so it's not the best receiver environment in the world. So I wanted to go up to the place in the country just about 50 miles north of here where we did field day this last year. And I was going to throw up a a wire in a tree or something there and take my laptop and do it from there. You know, it's a pretty quiet environment, um, no major interference there. So it would have been great. So I started looking at the Weather Channel, and every day, until the day of the eclipse, it was saying it's going to be scattered thunderstorms. It's going to be heavy thunderstorms just continuously. And I said, well, there's no need for me to drive 50 miles to set up an antenna just so I can pick up lightning. So I didn't go. I stayed here, and I said, well, I'll just do it from home. So I've got more noise than I wanted in this, but... I use the SDR to record the whole AM band at once. You know, you can record the IQ signals out of it, and it'll it picked up from like I don't know. It looks like below zero hertz, if that's even possible. I was in the negative hertz email, so it didn't. I actually made money on this, <laughs> <laughs> up to about two megahertz. So I got a, a big wide span, the AM band and more. All recorded. And you need a solid state hard drive if, and a decent computer if you're going to try to capture that much data, but it worked. Uh, my recordings are a little noisier than I would have liked. I caught a little bit of lightning from time to time, but basically I could have gone with my original plan and gone up to the country and done much better than I was actually able to do here. But I've got some evidence and I've got a few interesting observations. Uh, Because the eclipse didn't, you know, it didn't last that long, and we were not in the path of totality here. We were 90%, pretty good. What happens with radio waves, the ionosphere cools down a little bit, and it behaves differently. That's what I was banking on. It's going to act a little bit like night, but it's just a little thin line you can see across there. It was overcast here. I did manage to snap a couple of shots with my cell phone. I think that's oh. as it's approaching. Okay. Just, I mean, it was only there a few seconds. And then as it was leaving, I don't know if you can see it uh, see right it. there. You there's, can definitely see it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There's a little bit of it there. Now, let me show you this first. This is the SDR Uno software. And this is what I pick up during the day here in the Jackson area. I'm just north of Jackson. All those little spikes you see sticking up there are local stations. This right here is, guess what that is? Is that an image of a station or maybe your actual? That's an actual station. This is an image down here. These these are not real here. Uh, But this is navigation beacons. Oh, really? Uh, The Jackson Airport. Oh, yeah. Another one right here is the, uh, the other airport. That's I bet that's some good right listening. Here. Just transmitting either two or three letters of CW. And I okay. could pick up two of them here. And that's all I've ever been... At. Well, sometimes at night I might pick up another one. But apparently those things don't go very far. Hmm. Uh, they're, pro- they're real low power, and I'm sure they're trying I mean, to shoot you probably straight don't, up. You probably really don't want them going very far. You probably don't. Now, this thing out here at 1700, that's a spur from some of these others being mixed together or an image or something, same thing down here. Yep. So that's, that's typical what I'd see signal-wise during the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, all these, there's other ones down here, these real low ones. I can't quite copy them. The noise is so bad here 
I can't copy them. And if you notice all this around through here, this uh, blue and red area, that's noise. Yeah. Same thing down here. So that blanks out any signals that, that would be there. It just covers them up. Nighttime, this is what I see. Mm, quite different. Yeah. Every 10 kilohertz, there is a signal there. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't copy them all. Uh, you know, some, some of them, there might be 20 different stations on that frequency mm -hmm. and noise and all. But, you know, you can get a, a, a good many stations copied at night if you want to go down the AM band. But it's kind of eye-opening when you see it all at once with an SDR. That, yeah. Boy, the AM band is packed. And you notice yep. this, this navigation beacon really didn't change much. There might be a couple of others down here, but I really wasn't able to copy anything there. Now, this is typical nighttime. This is not during the eclipse. So if I overlay daytime on top of there, the red is the daytime stations. So all those others are ones that only come in at night. I only saw activity within like 15 minutes either side of totality. Yep. I didn't check down lower uh, or farther away time-wise, but there might be something there. I really didn't have a chance to shift through this data very good because if you think about, well, there's, there's this many different possible AM signals. It took me a while to listen to all those frequencies <laughs> for 10, minute, 10 or 15 minutes either side of totality, but I got through most of it. And I've, I've put together a few pictures here um, and some audio and a little bit of video of how this went down. Now, it's not the whole thing. Just it, it would have been too long. But this is on 640 kilohertz. 901 861 When life becomes complicated. How would you identify what that was? That's a good question. I was just wondering. Yeah. I was able to figure sure, out what station. Somewhere, right? well, Radio the, locator maybe or something? Uh, well, there there is a, a way that I figured out what it was. It took a couple of different resources to, to figure that out. Uh, first up, this right here is a map of that frequency, 640 kilohertz, and all the radio stations that are on that frequency. Right here in Memphis, you see that one almost would, it wouldn't quite come to Jackson. You see this big area mm -hmm. out around it. They don't go that far. These patterns on here are over enhanced. None of them go as far as, as they show here typically. Uh, so Memphis, it could possibly be it. Maybe it could be this one down here um, in New Orleans, but it's pointed the other direction. Maybe it could be this one over in Oklahoma or Atlanta. Our eclipse was right through here. Must so I said, Iowa. Memphis. Yeah. You want to know how I figured it out? It was Memphis? How did you, you figure it out? the top of the hour did until you? they ID'd? No, because at the top of the hour, I recorded that uh, at 1900, it, oh, okay. Zulu. It was not coming in. I didn't have enough signal there I could copy. But 30 seconds later, that's what we just heard. 901 When life becomes complicated. I looked up the phone number. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and it was for an auto repair shop in Collierville, Tennessee. Collierville, so Memphis, east of Memphis, yeah. yep. Yep, and that's where it was located. You can see what their signal is during the day. At night. Ah, they go directional. They got two towers, and they, they beam their signal out this way. Uh, during the daytime, let's see, that is a 50,000-watt station. At night, it goes down to 490 watts. Oh, was that, that about direction. 85, 90 dB on your uh, meter there? I forgot. I didn't see it real good. Probably, <laughs> yeah. Something <laughs> maybe, yeah, right around 93 dB. The SDR Uno software there you know it's, it looks pretty complicated it's it's not super complicated let me see if i can back up here it's not the most intuitive if you don't use it a lot uh, yeah you have to use it fairly often this is to, very powerful though yeah uh this is the frequency you're tuned in 
uh, your S meter, uh, some noise controls, uh, the a good zoomed in view of the frequency you're on, and then you know the whole bandwidth that you're capturing there, and you've got some. Uh, memories over here or a scanner and you've also got a schedule or recorder on it but what I wanted to show is my settings uh, for most of these I had the bandwidth out almost 10 kilohertz either side this is a carrier frequency my settings are what I want to show you I wasn't listening with AM I had uh, more noise when I did I switched to SAM synchronous AM double sideband uh, I did have a noise blanker on here, but it wasn't doing me any good. Uh, most of these, I wasn't able to use a noise blanker at all, and it, it really didn't help. I didn't use a noise reduction either uh, because that just kind of muddied it up. So the trick was to use synchronous AM and double side band. But if there was another station next door, I'd use uh, synchronous AM and either upper or lower side band. That was what I found to be best. Now, if I could have gone out to the country, I, w I would have done much better than this. But uh, synchronous AM is a pretty good trick. Now, I wanted to look a little bit further. I, uh, Mike, you have a puzzled look on your face there. Do you have... I'm just wondering if SDR... I haven't used SDR uh, Uno. I'm um, just wondering if it has a DSP filter option. So I found that to be very good for oh, yeah. AM. The, uh, the NR, noise reduction there, that's what that was. And if oh, it that's it. Okay. Yeah. And um, it just didn't help in this particular case with the noise that I had. It would make it more comfortable to listen to. But, yeah, if you've got the RSP-1, you ought to, you ought to grab a copy of that. Yeah, it's free. Yeah, it's, it's cheap old man. pretty comprehensive, too. Yeah, yeah I need to do uh, some more with that in, in addition to... Uh, I've also got that um, Adam Pluto, which will uh, serve as a receiver as well. Yeah. So too many toys, not enough time. Yeah. Here's another picture. And I was curious. I mean, we looked at the pattern, the day-night pattern of that station. But what did the transmitter site itself look like? It looks sort of like this right here. You see the two towers in the background there? That was it was a, a road trip. Yeah, you know, they're just using one tower during the day, but at night they switch on both of those and drop the power. But that's not their transmitter building right there. How did I know for sure these were radio towers for that station? Well, in the next shot here, just on the street view, just slight, I just pan to the left. There's your RFR warning sign there, and there's your tower registration number. <laughs> so, so you looked up the tower registration number? Uh, I couldn't quite see it. I tried to, yeah. Yeah, it's not working. But I knew I had a radio station when I saw that because all of them have to have that posted legally. You uh, must, must do this for a living or something. Yeah, I've, <laughs> it's, a, it's a hobby. <laughs> so next up, so that was on 640. I tried to, I tuned on up, didn't get anything until I landed on 680. Now, I say I didn't get anything. I actually probably could hear some little signals in there, but not enough that I could nearby identify it. So the next one I got was on 680. This was actually, I'm going from the lowest end of the dial up to the highest. So actually about two minutes before the recording we just heard, I, I heard this right here on 680. This is like that game show. Um, what was <laughs> yep. it called? Name that tune? Except so, for name that station for nerds. Name that, name that RF. There is a station in Memphis. It's WMFS. That was it. And the way I knew it was because what he said was must be a resident of Tennessee. Got to be that station. That's 50,000 watts. They're using one tower. This is uh, what it looks like in the daytime. Probably couldn't hear it here, even if I didn't have noise, because this, these patterns are you know, a little blown out of proportion. Uh, nighttime. Oh, you could hear it good here at night. Yeah. Look at that. 
Uh, they are they're using more towers at night to get that directional signal like that. Still fifty thousand watts. Hmm. So you take that fifty thousand instead of sending it in a circle, you send it all in one direction. Yeah, uh, you're gonna have have pretty good signal. There's the transmitter site. Oh. They've got four different oh. towers back here for the AM. This is a studio to transmitter link. You see the little 950 mm -hmm. megahertz dish? WMPS. That was WMFS now. But this was a, a heritage station. This is one of the early AM broadcast stations, WMPS. Uh, it was very well known. And you can tell by that building. That's been there a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... I, I was glad to see that, you know, particularly, I, I don't know, because uh, I grew up when we'd spent a lot of time listening to AM radio at night. People weren't really listening to FM that much uh, until a few years later. So that was uh, WMFS in Memphis. So we got two right there in Memphis. Now the next one... <laughs> That little window, the bottom right there, extends almost halfway across green SDR Uno scheduler. That's where I'm playing back these files from. You've got a record button. You can click it, and whatever's being displayed is going to be recorded as an IQ signal into a WAV file. It's not something you can load into Adobe Audition or um, any audio editor and play it because the sampling rate is so high. But you can load it back in here and then play it pieces at a time and it's got a little uh, time display so you can see where you are and it breaks it up into smaller files this is gigabytes and gigabytes worth of data here that station right there i tried the free online adobe enhanced speech to see if that would help you can copy the call letters now but it sounds like it made up a few new words and gave the guy a pretty bad lisp daytime pattern 50 kilowatts at night, it goes directional. It says here, four towers, 1,000 watts. However, the bird's eye view shows five towers. Let me let you listen to this and tell me if you think this is coming from Dallas. Hmm, did that sound like country music? Mm-mm. Mm -mm. It, I don't know if it did or not. Well, that's that's really what's kind of hard to make it too, out. For sure. I could hear a pattern in the music. So I had to look it up. KTXV. That's Radio Punjab. Or Punjab. P U N J A B. Oh, really? And so Indian. Was, oh. Indian. Yeah, yeah. there's Bali, Bali music. Yeah, there's yeah. A, there's a huge Indian population out there. Especially well, around Irving. They have their own radio station. They don't have fifty thousand watts. That was twenty thousand watts. But hey, we picked it up here. And it is directional during the daytime. They're using three towers. Now at night, a uh, similar pattern. Uh, still 20,000 watts, three towers. This is what the map show, and I'm not convinced that everything this map shows is correct. But... It's on the Internet, it has to be. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> Actually, this may be... Uh, no, that's it. That's it. So, there was... Something really interesting about this one. And it was yep. directional and it you cool. know wasn't necessarily pointing this direction. Uh, yeah, it was kind of southeast to northwest. Yeah. Yeah. Now I think this map is not right because the information I saw at night it's only 250 watts. So I, it hadn't got this kind of pattern at night. So so far we've got Memphis, Birmingham, Alabama. Dallas, we're reaching out a little bit further, Nixon actually. DX. It's Maybank, M-A-B-A-N-K, or however you pronounce that. That's where it's located in Texas. That was on 89. 
you never picked it up at night here because it's only 250 watts and WLS is on that frequency, which by the way, I was hoping I would pick up, but not a, not a hint of hearing I, I WLS. WLS just booms in here yeah. at night. Yeah. It does you hear could, part of the You don't night. even have to use an antenna and it'll pick it up. Yep. Yeah. Now this next one, I don't, I don't think there will be any doubt. You should be able to pick out exactly what this is right here. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> that was Radio Polsky. Polsky, really? And Vernon Polish. Hill, Illinois. Wow. It's uh, it's only ten kilowatts. I'm impressed that you heard it because I I really couldn't make any of that out. I couldn't make it out either, but I figured that's the only thing I saw on the map there that looked like a possibility. Uh, right up here, and this was what time was this? This was 1903. So this is Chicago, 10,000 watt station, nighttime. That's that tiny little thing. We never would have heard that at night. <laughs> so this would have been, this is going to be the only time in 20 years that we could hear Polish music on AM radio here, probably. <laughs> well, that and wasn't I music. missed it. Yeah. Well, he, was, he was going on about something. I don't have any idea what it was. At night, it goes down to 120 watts. Polish radio. Barefoot. Barefoot. Now, this is interesting. Oh. WNVR, 10 kilowatt daytime. Look at those towers, man. Those are little. Yeah, they're, using, they're using hex beams. Yeah, now they're, they're on. No, it's not hex beams. <laughs> they're on. What are they, capacity top hats or something? They're on 1030 kilohertz. So, you know, their towers is to be a quarter wavelength. It's going to be over 200 feet. Um, probably, I, I don't want to say for sure, probably close to 300, but these towers don't look anywhere near that tall to me. Yeah, those are capacitive top hats, but I haven't ever seen any exactly like that. And look at the ground down here. Yeah, you see that radials or what? That's some kind of radials. That's pretty unusual right there. Mm -hmm. So I did want to share that. <laughs> now, this next one is a legacy station as well. Um, <laughs> You can pick them up at night here, I'm pretty sure. But let's see if, if we can hear anything here that can help us to identify this one. I couldn't make that out. I really couldn't get any audio on that. So I don't know if I should have claimed that as a, as a win or not. Probably not. But I did... Uh, Get it in my log. I believe it was WHO. Who? In Des Moines, yeah. Iowa. Yeah, that's what I, yeah. <laughs> Who? Who do you think it is? <laughs> I'm, I believe that was it because, and my reason for it, this was uh, 1902. So the sun, you know, had already kind of passed us. It was, you know, it was more up in, in this direction somewhere. And so stations were, I'm thinking they were more, you know, coming from this area. That's a big signal. And I actually recorded a little more of it, but I think it, it was either a sports or a news talk station. And that's what that signal was. They were playing that. So I think that's who it was, who it was. Was who? Let's see, what you, did, let's see what you did yeah. there. At nighttime, you can pick it up here. You can pick it up. Maybe you can pick it up at Mike's house. Oh, yeah. Mike's well in that oh, circle. Yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't quite go as far as a circle, but uh, 10 for I have a question for you, Professor. Yeah. Um, what designates or, or what signifies a legacy station? Uh. Just being real old, uh, WJDX here, I'd call a, a legacy or a heritage so I'm station. I'm a legacy ham. 
<laughs> um, because it went on the air in 1929, a okay. picture of its transmitter building. It was built like an old cathedral-style radio. Right, so it's not necessarily like a three-letter call. No, it doesn't have to be three letters because there were only there weren't many licensed with three letters. But if it's right. got a three-letter call, yeah, you it's going to be a heritage or a legacy station. Then this might be sure. a good time to to let folks know because obviously we make assumptions that everybody's a licensed amateur, but uh, what George did uh, don't. You don't require an amateur radio license no. to do that because you're receiving it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, back in the day, uh, what they call those uh, those people? In fact, I, I think the the radio stations used to issue QSL cards. I used to if yeah. you gave them a signal report. Yeah, I used to get letters from people who had picked up WJDX, and not W5JDX, the the AM station WJDX. And I used to send them QSL cards. I had QSL cards there, and I'd I'd mail them one if That's they gave cool. me a signal report. In yeah, the, I forgot what the term they used to give those people the DX AM D, DX chasers, I think. Yeah, DXers. There was a American. I can't remember the name of it now, but there's actually a club that published a book of charts that looked like those uh, maps we've been looking at. There, there wasn't the internet back you know it hadn't always been there so the only way you could get that information was printed form somewhere so there was one of those clubs it wasn't the radio club of america but it was one like that just for dxers and there's still uh an international radio dxers club that's for you know am broadcast listeners that uh, would be a, a good intro for uh for radio, if you're interested in picking up uh, long distance stations and so forth, uh, you could do that with just a hundred dollar SDR play and you hook it up to your computer and away you go. You string yep. a wire up and, and you're in business. I, well, you I can... remember laying in the bed and uh, listening to the radio when I was lived in Virginia when I was a kid, listening to that. What was that? WSM out of New Orleans? I Nashville. Nashville. There was yeah. one in New Orleans. W W L. W W L. That okay, that's one I listened yeah. to. Eight eight seventy AM. Yep. Um, <laughs> but you don't you don't even need that. You could just about any AM radio you could DX with. Um it's it's pretty amazing. I, you know, I've mentioned to several family members in the last week or so, like this is what I'm gonna do during the eclipse. But some of them didn't even, the younger ones didn't even realize that AM skips like that at night. Mm hmm. They never medium listened wave, to it. Yeah, medium wave dick, DXing and uh, SWL too. I mean, yes. I still I still spin the dial on my radio uh -huh. sometimes at night, Tommy. Yeah, just me, to do it. me too, man. Yeah, I too. got that receiver there. I've got the antenna hooked up to it. I listen to it all the time. It's really, when I'm in, it's well, really when fun I'm in too. Um, yeah. I used to do it all the time. In fact, some of the uh, heritage stations, like you mentioned, um, still use, still run the old classic jingles from time to time. It's yeah. kind of interesting to hear them yeah. uh, identify their station in a, in a, in a um, musical. I don't know how you describe that. You'd have to listen to a to a radio jingle. Yeah, Mike. To, to understand it, <laughs> you ask how could you identify a legacy or a heritage station. This is one other sign right here. That is the a made out of Oh, cement. the tower type? Well, the, the building. 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 Yeah. It's, 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 our de it's our deco. And the yeah. tower type. Yeah, that's WHO, the one we just listened okay. to that I really couldn't Ooh. identify for positive. <laughs> but, when I see that, I think about the Santa Communications building. Well, that, that's that WJDX. Yeah. It is a similar style to this. Not quite as big. I was hoping to see call letters, but they're not there. The reason that building would be so big, and this was probably, hmm, I don't know what station, uh, what year that went on the air. It was probably in the 1910s or 20s. I don't know for sure. But uh, the transmitters were big. And, you know, this is 50 kilowatt station, so it, Transmitter or if was they really have an big. antenna matrix in the backyard. Upstairs, <laughs> the upstairs probably was the chief engineer and his family. 
Mm -hmm. That's what this was over here at WJDX upstairs mm. where... Uh, the residence for the engineer. Yeah. And so a lot of these older stations will they'll either have a big building like that with an upstairs or they'll have a house built out beside it because the engineer lived um, at the station during that time period. Wow. It's like it's like a late housekeeper in back in the yep. day. Put fluorescent bulbs in there. You don't even need to pay the electric bill. <laughs> George, right. uh, 1924, George. 1924. That's That sounds about right. Who AM, it's called, with a big owl Who? symbol. <laughs> that building reminds me of that um, that special episode you did of the, um, oh, what's that Voice station in Ohio? Yeah, Voice, Voice of America. America. Voice and of America, VOA, yes. Yeah, or WLW. We did, we did that, too. I'm thinking of WLW, but... Yeah, uh, Randy released the video on that. We had the same tour he did, but uh, we also shot uh, Voice of America that same weekend during uh, Hamvention. We edited it. Randy edited uh, the WLW and got it posted, so we didn't post our WLW mm -hmm. video. But it was, um, it, it's, if you can catch a tour of one of those, you can always catch a tour of VOA when you're in Dayton or when you're at Hamvention. You should check that out. Yeah, you really should. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. So, it's cool stuff. That's, that's part of what I did. And I got a lot more, but. We'll come back and look at a few more a little later. Right now, we're going to take a break, and we'll get a message here from ICOM. But first, Tommy, I think you had something there, a post or an email or Actually, something. Actually, I had an email. So anyway, this comes from my friend John. I think he's in the chat room. I'm pretty sure I saw it. K2BAG. It says, uh, hi, guys. Hope you've been good since Huntsville. Going back. To episode 188, you guys encouraged me to update my hotspots. I have four to the Pi Zero 2W. Now they're normal prices. Tommy mentioned what a difference in performance. It, re it really is, too. As you did, I changed to the amazing WPSD system. It's so much better than the original Pi Store. In doing this, I was thinking, how could I remotely manage the hotspots like I do with my other systems? Um, I use Tailscale, and uh, that's what I've got on the screen here. He sent a link to it, Tailscale.com. It's free, so I thought that, I bet you Emil's ears just jumped up. Like, if you have 100 endpoints, or under 100 endpoints, it creates a private, secure VPN LAN with each endpoint having a private IP. For my PCs, I use just VNC Remote Desktop Manager for the on the website, uh, Tailscale.com, download slash Linux. It'll actually install the client. He said he got brave and ran the scripts on the SSH session and it installed. Now from any device in any location on this Telescale network, he can get to the web interface, even from his phone, which is on the Telescale network. And anyway, that's pretty cool. I, I saved that link, John. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to check this out. Uh, I, I thought I'd hope to do it before the show yep. tonight, but I didn't get a chance to. to Stuff happened. It's been kind of crazy at my work, too. But at any yeah. rate, it's uh, pretty cool stuff. Put a spring in your step with ICOM. Get outside this spring and work out the kinks in your station. Fixing ice-damaged HF antennas, preparing for an upcoming VHF contest, or portable operations, ICOM has the radio for you. Upgrade your station with one of ICOM's fabulous HF radios. With the IC7610, Faint signals are no longer challenging for DXers and contesters. The high-performance RMDR can pick out the faintest of signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. This is the SDR every ham wants. With ICOM's IC905, VHF contesting is a breeze. This all-mode rig covers five bands with one radio. 2 meters, 70 centimeters, 1.2 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.6 gigahertz bands, and with the optional CX10G transverter, 10 gigahertz. Large color touchscreen, easy D-Star settings, and a separate controller and RF module configuration to reduce signal loss. Explore the world of microwave with the IC905. 
The IC705 and IC7300 are the perfect go-to rigs for outdoor hams who love POTA and SOTA activations. Both radios feature a large touchscreen with real-time spectrum scope and waterfall for intuitive function and setting operations. The IC705 provides base station features and performance in the palm of your hand from HF to 50, 144, and 440 MHz. The IC7300 is an industry first, using RF direct sampling and an entry-level HF radio. If you're getting a head start on hurricane season, ICOM's IC7100, ID5100, ID50, or ID52 are the perfect traveling companions and should be on your go-kit list. From high-powered base stations to compact and travel-friendly handhelds, ICOM radios offer in-demand features and functions to keep you active on all bands, inside your shack, or out in the field. For more information about ICOM's amateur radios, visit icomamerica.com amateur today. You know, when you got noise and stuff, <laughs> it, it's hard to, to get rid of it. You could even have a rattle. Hmm. A rattle, eh, you say, eh, George? Yes. Have you got well, something to say about that? I do. I do, absolutely. So, you know, you guys know how I uh, like to find some of those cost-challenged challenge, uh, items and modes out there. Well, I just so happened to find one and put it through its uh, paces and the only thing I ask, George, from you is a uh, reprieve from the uh, snake-killing hoe from my segment. Well, hello, Tommy and George and Mike and Amateur Logic TV viewers. In this episode, I was going to take a look at a uh, project from a, a team using cell phones not necessarily on the cell services and some digital modes that are, may be familiar with some of our ham users the program is actually called rattlegram and the uh, website that's uh running it is called ribbitradio.org and uh, they actually won the uh, 2023 Technical Innovation Award from the ARRL on this project. So I figured I'd give it a, a look. <clears throat> Basically, it's digital messaging using your smartphone, either an uh, iOS device or an Android device, with software that they wrote um, that can actually use OFDM, which is something we've talked about in the past, uh, orthogonal. Frequency multiplex division, OF or division multiplexing, uh, OFDM basically. So I think that's one of the uh, topics on the extra exam, if I'm not mistaken. There's quite a bit of videos out there already on it and what they're doing with it, and demos and demonstrations of people using it. So I figured I'd give it a whirl and do the same thing. This is a project of a organization called the Open Research Institute. Or ORI, lots of information about them, open research. There's some pretty interesting projects out here that I see besides this one. That's uh, stuff they're working on um, for multiple reasons, multiple uh, subjects. So neat stuff. The, the protocol involved here is a digital protocol. You see here AI codex GMBH or coded orthogonal frequency division multiplexing television is is their uh, term for it, COFDM TV, which is an open protocol and published protocol. It's got several uses, but here they're using it basically as a uh, a text texting. So you might have plenty of smart devices out there with uh, some sometimes the service is not always working so you can use it to generate these tones with uh, more local radio point-to-point -point communications or repeaters if you have them as far as that goes so uh pretty interesting information again and i wanted to give it a whirl so let's do that okay
Okay. All right, let's take a quick look at the software here. The um, software itself is called Rattlegram, and uh, we'll go into that software. And there's quite a few settings here for the encoders, decoders, part modes, and night modes, uh, aesthetics, and uh, the danger zone, as they call it. Places to put call signs. I've used it on uh, ham as well as GMRS and MERS, which all allow unobfuscated data. And uh, as long as it's published protocols, the encoder settings are interesting here. One of the uh, interesting or more interesting features here is the carrier frequencies where you can actually s choose where your audio for the modem is going to be, somewhat like packet radio where you're giving it a place to start so you can match some filtering issues or uh, things that might be happening on your radio or particular bands and get it optimized uh, besides that there's also settings for in the encoder for what they call the fancy header with that enabled you you actually get a drawn call sign on a waterfall display as a part of the audio uh, packet that gets sent out. So the people actually see the information on the waterfall, much less decode it digitally. The decoder settings have spectrum analysis where you can actually see the, the signal and see how it fits into what your phone is hearing or what your devices are hearing from its sources. And uh, get an idea of audio levels. Here, obviously, you're seeing my voice as I'm uh, doing it in real time. Lots of information about the system and the protocols used, links to all of the projects, disclaimers, and what have you. This is version 1.12 on the Android platform. So lots of uh, features there. interesting so, do you remember yeah, so it, it reminds me of man net do you remember that no yeah it, it came out I, I don't know if it's gone anywhere but i i was doing some searching while you were running your segment and uh it gives a history on it um www.scalar.com slash topics slash man net m-a-n-n-e-t Okay, uh, I'll have to check that one out too. You'll have to check that one out. I'll send you the link later. But um, interesting. Now, yeah, I, I have a question. Does it okay? What, what is it using for um, the radio in the cell phone? If it's not using the cell cell network, is it using like it's Wi-Fi? It's literally or? okay. Imagine this. It's audio coupled. It's it's literally like the old couple modems where you put it next to the yeah, radio. Yeah, it sound it sounded like AX25. It's it's actually OFDM TV, that protocol that I mentioned in there, right. which is published. It's using that um, protocol and you're you're literally audio coupled. Now you can put, you know, audio out from your phone to the radios through the uh, like Kimwood jacks or other methods for a mic sure. and a speaker. But I haven't found a way not to decode it yet just with audio coupling. Like it's that resilient where it was just working. So right. do, I noticed you could, you said you could choose the frequency there. Of the it. AF. Does the other party need to know that Hey. Yes. Okay. I'm on 1500. Or, or I bet you, I mean, I haven't actually tried to change it just to see what will happen on the receive side. But 
I'm pretty sure if I'm on 1500 AF starting, the other side probably has to be around there. Just like packet, packet usually starts around 1700, if I'm not mistaken. But you can move it around to have multiple signals on that same passband, you know. So there's there's some. Uh, uh, that's the AF side, right? The audio yeah. frequency. Hmm. Cool. It's pretty interesting. It makes me think of a uh, long time ago. I remember there was a PSK31 decode program for your phone. You could it worked the same way, acoustic coupling. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty neat. So do y'all, are y'all using it for stuff down there now? So we do have GMRS repeaters, right? And it it's possible over that as well as ham. Uh, what you saw me using in the video was with my uh, wife and her Android phone and mm. a MERS radio, which is license free, right? Or licensed radio. So um, the uh, those had no trouble uh, doing anything. And I think ICOM's MERS radios have all the you know tones built into them and all these things that you know will make privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. there, so it just worked over that. It was decoding, encoding. I could read the uh waterfall text. I don't know if you guys remember uh, what was it, Easy Pal? We, we, yeah, there's a yeah, you could actually transmit fonts over that spectrum, hmm. the waterfall, so you can see text. Yes, just... now I have seen that in a radiogram before, shortwave radiogram. Yes, and that. That's pretty cool. Somebody yeah, sat down amazing. and figured that out. Yeah. That's the fancy, that fancy mode that I was showing you. That when you turn that on, whatever's in the call sign field will automatically be transmitted at the end of the protocol. Huh. Cool. And that was my uh, GMRS call sign. Well, heck, that is <laughs> fancy. Huh? Well, it is fancy. I see fancy. why they named it that. And, and it's now, cheap. He really. It's cheap. Well, I'm I'm going to stop you right there, uh, Mike, because uh -oh. in order not go. to give this away, there's a secret decoded message in that video for anyone who wants to audio couple the video. Oh man! Okay. Uh, if wow. you if you checked out, Mill you know, does Easter eggs. <laughs> it is definitely an Easter egg. So anybody who sends it to me, I'll uh, I'll give the kudos out. Hmm. The kudos, not the cooties. The cooties and the kudos. Yeah. I mean, yeah, one's, they, they one's desirable, ball. one you want to kind of stay away from. What about the fancy header? But you got to have the fancy header. Yes. Yes. This is the fa this is the fancy header. Okay. Right. The Wilson hat. Well, Mike, you didn't have uh, an email or a message tonight, but you just wanted I to didn't. mention something I guess it, here. I guess it was a slow news week. I know everybody had already talked about the eclipse, so. There was no no use flogging a dead horse. I didn't really have any experience, personal experience to report on that due to uh, the weather conditions not cooperating. But um, yeah, I know you you folks down there had some severe weather, and obviously, uh, Emil, you were you were without power for a couple of days, and uh, I know we had some weather here. We didn't get the nasty weather that they were calling for. They were calling for. Um, golf ball sized tail, but we never got that, thankfully. But um yeah, I know you folks got some uh, some twisters down there. So that got me thinking about generators again. And um I just thought we'd take a few minutes to talk about generators. I know Emil you have one and and George and Tommy you have one and I was thinking about uh, maybe getting one, although we're pretty pretty lucky up here. Uh, we don't need it need one that often. And um I was just uh, wondering, I did a little research on my own and, and uh, kind of concluded that I needed either something with really low total harmonic distortion, um, and I was trying to avoid going with something uh, that was gasoline powered because during a during a crisis, I'm kind of rural and, and everybody's heading to the gas station to fill up their cars and such, so... Um, I wanted to avoid um, having to have uh, gasoline for the generator. Uh, we have a very good uh, network of natural gas that's uh, piped in. In fact, uh, during the big uh, blackout of what was it, 2001, uh, where all the eastern seaboard lost power for, uh, well, in my particular case, it was 19 hours, um, the natural gas 
uh, supply was was totally unaffected. So uh, I was kind of looking at that, and I I just wanted to get uh, you guys uh, your opinions on on that. Well, uh, I know you need something with low t- THD, and it looks like the inverter generators are starting to get bigger. <laughs> Go ahead, Emil. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, you, you'll you probably be able to find, especially in your area, probably a lot of inverter uh, natural gas generators from Lowe's or from uh, other, you know, even Harbor, Harbor Freight or other places that have uh, some of these uh, things. And yeah, the inverters are definitely going to have a much smoother uh, sine wave available for some of your more sensitive equipment. And uh, a lot of them are also multi-fuel types. So I, I don't know exactly what y'all have up there, but uh, I am using a gasoline uh, one down here. And uh, you're right. We did have to run out. We had to figure out all the power was out. So we had to go a little bit further up north from us and west to uh, get what we needed. But well, uh, yeah, a lot of these you see these days, um, maybe inverters, but, uh, you know, uh, traditional generators as well. The smaller ones now, multi-fuel will run on gasoline, um, propane or natural gas. Now, one thing to keep in mind, um, I really didn't want to talk about generators today because I've been working with generators all week because of power failures everywhere. But ours, we don't have any diesel generators at the stations I'm working for now, which is what you'd normally use, something like that. But ours, all of them run on butane. So we've got like... uh, thousand gallon butane tanks okay and you know those will last pretty pretty long time you won't need anywhere near that and if you've got natural gas actually ours at the studio here does run on natural gas because it's in town so don't have to worry about keeping the tank full but here's the deal you have to derate the generator capacity based on your fuel Gasoline, right. you'll get more power. Natural out of gas it. being the the most derated of them all. Yes, um, I think it goes gasoline, then propane, then natural gas. But the other the other thing I need to consider, although because of global warming, <laughs> changing the climate, um, apparently natural gas has a and the same thing with propane. It has a problem in the cold temperature, so I'm not sure how um, that's going to work out either. Well, it doesn't quite get that cold here, but all the diesel generators I've dealt with in the past had to have block heaters on them. Yeah. Uh, you know, to keep the yeah, water even, warm. Even the, yeah. the work 48 kilowatt uh, natural gas generator has a block heater, too. All right. I guess it's more or less for the oil. So it's mine it's not doesn't. As heavy. Ours, Ours doesn't. Yeah, because it probably we're not doesn't get as cold. It. But w- any diesel generator here, we would have a block heater on, but. But these propane and natural gas ones, uh, we're not. I mean, I, well, a couple of the ones I have do have block heaters. They are Kohler brand, but uh, the Generac brand ones we've got, none of them have block heaters. And they seem to crank okay when it's cold, but it doesn't get as cold as, right. you know, as what you're dealing with. So, yeah. Uh yeah, I was I told um, in reading my my articles on generators that ideally you want to find a generator that has a, a THD value of five percent or less. Um, I guess the good, even the gasoline, the good ones have a, a, a THD of about five percent. Um, the inverters are closer to like two percent from what I understand, but uh, they obviously, you can't get them in as large a capacity. And here's the other thing too, I'm rural, so uh, like a mill, he needed to get one that would supply 240, 220 volts in addition to 110, 120 mm-hmm. um, to run uh, things like well pumps and that sort of thing. So um, that kind of narrows the selection down a little bit. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it does. I'd say, well, buy one bigger than you think you're going to need, especially if you're running off natural gas because 
You, you know, so, you need the derating, but also you, you've you got more or less an endless fuel supply there rather than right. putting it in five gallons at a time. So if you burn a little extra, you know. Yeah, and I, I somebody, either I read it or heard it from somebody. They said, if you can lift it, it's not big enough. Yes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's accurate. Yeah. I th- remember I said there really wasn't any plan tonight and everything was kind of thrown together pretty yeah. loosely. We changed the order in which we were going to do this, but nobody bothered telling the computer that. Oh, that we man. Were, I thought yeah. computers were a lot smarter than that. Well, you never know. We need to implement AI. I know a lot of you watch Amateur Logic and Ham College. Well, on last month's Ham College, which was just a, about a week ago when I'm recording this, we went over, it was kind of a tough topic for me, uh, Smith charts. And I found it very interesting. So I, I did see that my little Nano VNA that I've shown on here before has a Smith chart. So I thought I'd just kind of do a little experiment. I'm going to calibrate it for 20 meters or 40 meters, whatever, maybe both, who knows, and uh, check my antenna. But I want to see the correspondence between the Smith chart and the SWR. So if, I think I should be able to get both of those on the screen at the same time. So let's just take a look at it. It's kind of more of a uh, an exploration video here than a technical one. Um, but anyway, I hope you find it interesting. Let's, let's take a look. I've got my t- antenna hooked up to this little pigtail so that I can get all the way over here. I'll hook it up to uh, port one or S11 as it's labeled on my Nano VNA. First of all, I need to calibrate. So let's let's do that. Got my little goodies here. I've got my stubs for calibration. There's my load. There's my short, and there is my open. So let's uh, let's take a look. Let's uh, go ahead and I'll go ahead and put the uh, the open on first because I know that's one that we need to calibrate with first. So let's power on. And go. we'll go ahead and go straight into Calibrate. Oops, first of all we need to set the Stimulus, which is the frequency range. So I'll set the start frequency. I'll just do 14 megahertz. Megahertz. The stop will be, I think it's 14350 if I'm not mistaken. Megahertz. Okay, so there's our range at the bottom right here. I apologize, there's a little bit of a glare because I tried to get rid of that, but I couldn't get rid of it. So anyway, 14 to 14,350. And let's get rid of some of these traces on here. So let's go back. Um, Display, trace. We'll turn off the ones we don't need. Okay, so I'm going to turn on trace one. Let's go ahead and set up for SWR. If I can remember how. That's one SWR. And we're going to need to set scale. And I'll do each one of these will be 0.5. So let's do a scale for division 0.5. Enter. Now I've got uh, the SWRs through the roof, so let's go ahead and calibrate. I could have done that before, but I just didn't. Calibrate. The open is already on. This wants the short, which is this one right here. Apologize, some of you have seen this part before, some of you may haven't, so I just thought I'd run through the quick calibration. Okay, so there's the short. And it's ready for the load, which is a, basically a little 50 ohm dummy load, so to speak. Okay, and the load. Okay, that's done, so I'll just do done. And we'll go back. Back, 
get rid of there, there. We can see our SWR is 1.0 because this is a 50 ohm load. So let's go ahead and hook our antenna up. And we can see at 14 megahertz my SWR is 1.4. Hmm, I wish it'd be a little better than that, but I can live with that. Oops. Let's go ahead and get back out of that. I just use this. And we can use the uh, switch at the top to move the marker over. You can see the frequency changing 14.101. It's the lowest at uh, 14,220, maybe 14,225. It's almost perfect, 1.08. Probably a little hard to see that. I'll see if I can zoom it in for you, but it's right there. Okay, now let's see if we can get the Smith chart on the, uh, on the screen. I think we need to do two first. Oh, there it is right there. Okay, that wasn't that hard. So we actually have both of them on the screen. If you watch Tim College, I think this is the uh, one that shows the resistance, this perfectly straight center line. Let me make it a little easier to see. We'll turn off that one. Now, the center line right there is a resistance. The farthest left, if I remember right, is a dead short farthest right is open and we'll test that with these stubs here in just a minute so let's uh, let's actually do that so I'm going to unhook the antenna and I'll put the short on and uh, there it goes sure enough it goes all the way to the left it's a dead short so that proved that let's put the open which is basically what we've got right now it doesn't matter it's just go through the motions but you can see it's all the way to the right so that's open dead short is all the way to the left this is a 50 ohm load and we should fall right on that line which is the 50 ohm mark right there and you can see the ohms right here 49.099 it keeps jumping back and forth to 50 it's a little fluctuation in it for some reason. Well, there you go. You can see that a little bit better like that. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. I guess back in the old days, we kind of discussed a little bit of this on Ham College. It, by the way, you can go check out that Ham College right here if you want to watch it for a little primer to this segment. But anyway, uh, you would take your measurements and then you could plot out your SWR on the Smith chart using a protractor like George showed in his uh, segment on Ham Nation a while back. But uh, this day and time, I'm not sure why you would use it. If you do know a good reason to use it, instead of just using the uh, SWR meter and the other tools that are built in, uh, shoot me an email, Tommy at amateurlogic.tv. I'd like to hear from you and uh, see some good use cases for it. I find it it's interesting the way it's laid out, and I, I'm not going to even pretend to know everything about it, but... At any rate, it's a uh, it's interesting tool, and I'm going to be reading some more on it. You'll probably see some more segments on it in the future. But that's the anyway. Let's go back to what we were doing. That's the 50 ohm mark. You can see my my load is a perfect 50 ohms. So let's hook my antenna back up and see where it is. Okay, it looks like I'm at 54, and my SWR is 1.088. So let's uh, let's move this back over to the highest part. This the highest one on this antenna. We're at 14 megahertz, it's 65. Wow, that's, I guess that's still okay because I still my SWR is still 1.4. Um, I'd like it a little lower, but that's perfectly acceptable. You notice this little arc right here is pretty small. 
I don't know how to make it any larger on here for you to see it, but it'll that little marker will move along that arc as we uh, move up in frequency. So let's try that. It's a cool tool. I don't know in this day and time uh, why you'd use it, like I mentioned. The VNA has this built in. Uh, pop, obviously, somebody uses it. Uh, George has a little uh, antenna analyzer that has it built in. You can see right here. Um, looks pretty cool. But uh, shoot me an email, Tommy at amateurlogic.tv, if you have a practical use for it. Hope you found this interesting. We'll catch you on the next one. 73. 73, Tommy. In yeah. 74, whatever it takes. Yeah. That, that Smith chart, the only thing I can think of, and I might be off base, but um, that would show you inductive and capacitive reactants in addition yeah. to a SWR, where normally an SWR meter wouldn't do that. So I'm it's a pretty complex say, thing. It, it does way more than we can even imagine. I think that's kind of, yeah, I mean, kind of where I fall on the scale. Would, would only... <laughs> really be if you were designing antennas or or wanted the absolute best antenna for that particular um, application but uh, one of my HF rigs has a built-in antenna tuner and it will give you an a uh, Smith chart rep, um, display as well it's it's the Kachina 505 that does that definitely going to use it VNA some more because that yep. thing does so much, man. Yeah, like I've had I barely even scraped the surface well, on anything it you, does. You just got yourself nominated to do all the antenna tuning for Phil Day <laughs> this year. <laughs> and it was Philip Smith, I think. Huh? Philip Smith with Bell Laboratories who came up with that. Was it? Uh, I may have been. I don't. That's my eye doctor's yeah. name. I'll talk to him about that when I go get my eyes checked next time. Yeah. Well, Tommy, I've got. A few more radio stations here that I heard. Cool, bring them on. Outside, Boulder Mon wanted the Macy about plant dust in this century. Rumpy, a lot like that. My only feeling is here on the things that I thought. I don't think you could hear that, but I listened to it a bunch of times and figured out. What Paul all heard we... was for more information, and then the rest was all staticky. Yeah, well, he actually had the call letters in there. Did he? He did. Yeah. George has AM ears, y'all. Uh, that was they, they weren't working that great. So <laughs> <laughs> here's what we got to choose from. All of these stations right here. This one kind of, let me see what time it was. This was uh, 1903. So I don't know where the sun was at the time. Probably more up in this way. But I, I heard the call signs WDFB in there Kentucky. It is. 1,000 watts. There's no way you'd hear a 1,000 watt AM station down here mm -mm. in the daytime. Uh, you probably wouldn't hear it at night either. I'm not even sure what he is at night, if they've even got... No, they don't. They don't have night time. But there's the uh, there's the station right there. The next one here, this one, well, it's a little more than a thousand watts, but let's see if we can pick out anything on it at all. I can't make much of it out. Yeah. Here's somebody talking. Well, if you had a map... And then you could see what was on 1080. That would be a big help. That KRLD, 50,000 watt in Dallas. Over in Dallas. That's who that one was. Didn't have much doubt about it. Uh, nighttime. Look at that signal at night. Oh, wow. That's huge. They are 50,000 watts, two towers. So still 50,000 watts, but they beam it all this way. Um. Uh, you'd even pick them up here, I think, at night. Going down to Mexico. I picked that up at 1851. So this was this was uh, before totality here. How do you know that? Was that in the was the time in the file? Yes. What was it? Yeah. Um, well, I recorded 20 meters, but I didn't haven't even looked at it yet. Still sitting in the hard drive. Okay. Um, 
times in the uh, the scheduler window. Okay, it's it's there. This Somebody next, was asking how y'all recorded that too, Tommy. Uh, this was recorded with SDR Uno. Okay. Yeah, the Part scheduler the window George showed. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. You do it from there. Yeah. It's, uh, okay. It, the, one of the SDR play receivers, SDR Uno is one I use. Oh, excuse me. RSP Duo is a receiver I use, but all of theirs use the SDR Uno software. I think they were asking how big the files were, too. What was it, like Huge. a video? The next one here is a, it's on 1140. See if, see if you can pick anything out here. I heard the W, but not no. All right. Well, <laughs> I, I think this is actually the station we just heard, which is WBXR. Right there. That's the one I said don't listen to. That is... It says Hazel Green, Alabama. Right there. Right on the Tennessee state line. Fifteen KW, so not a huge surprise. Two towers, you can see the pattern's not round. It's got a little distortion to it there. All right, the so next one up is on eleven sixty. Uh, the one we just heard, which surprised me a little bit, this was eighteen fifty eight. So instead of nineteen hundred, like the others, and the other thing that surprised me about that last one. They're on this side of us. Mm-hmm. You know, most of the ones we've been picking up are over in this Except area. Except for the one in Birmingham. Except the one in Birmingham. That one's, you know, on the back side of us. And some of them were, were really a surprise. All right, 1160. This is at 1852. So this would have been before totality by a little bit. no. <laughs> I know, girl, mm. right? Is <laughs> that <laughs> Vietnamese or Asian station? or That is Asian. Yeah. And which helped to determine when I started researching it what station that could be. Dallas. Is pointed straight at us, 35 kilowatts, six towers. Jeez, Tom. That is KBDT, and they broadcast Asian programming. Yeah, which, look at that. Look at that pattern. That's yeah. definitely directional to the east there. All right, that's the daytime, daytime. pattern. I think, uh, let's see. That's the, the site right there. Look at there. Wow. Two. Four, six towers. Wow, that's yeah. crazy, man. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh-oh. Yep. At night, they have a completely different location where they're using five towers. Somebody hmm. spent a lot of money when yeah. they left that. That was on 1160. That's not the only station I picked up on 1160. Just like, uh, when did I say that was? 1852? Eight minutes later. Bot yeah. Radio Network? Bot Radio Network. It's not that kind of bot. Net? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I thought it was going to be AI just no. talking about random stuff. It's a it's a Christian radio network. And, I, you know, I couldn't copy the call sign because when they ID'd, it was just too noisy. Talk radio at the MD. They were everywhere. Talk radio available everywhere. That was KFXR. Oh, wow. At night, 12 towers. Hello. No way. 5,000 watts. Now, wow. daytime, daytime, they were only 5,000 watts, and we were picking them up here. And what kind uh, of music was that? No, there's 50,000 day. Uh, night. Wow. 12 towers, 5,000 watts. Two, four, six, eight. That's the daytime. They have a different site for nighttime. Two, four, six, eight, ten, Season. 12 towers. Incredible. Somebody spent a lot of money building that. 
But why would you do that? Why would you use that many towers? Or you saw that pattern they had to the west. They went uh, in yeah. the real direction. So that they, they wanted could, to do Baja, California? They they wanted to cover this yep. area. Yep. And that. And there's going to be, and I'm not showing it here, but one of these stations over here is going to have a huge signal, and they're protecting them at night. They can't let their signal go this way because it'll be interfering with a, another clear channel station out here. KXEL in Iowa. That was on 1540. That is was at one time owned by Cyan Bayhackle. The first radio station I ever owned. Worked at? It worked out. I didn't ever own one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was was uh, one was Cy and Bay Heckle's first radio station in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. Mm. Years later, I worked at a TV station that he owned, a Channel Six that was over in Greenwood, and I remember them talking about KXEL. He he owned it too. Two towers at night, and they put all the signal this direction, fifty thousand watts. It's the Squidworth pattern. Super cardioid. Yes. <laughs> it does look like that. And this is the transmitter <laughs> site right here. Two towers. Look at the building. That That's an older building. Not ancient. There's a microwave. In silos. I just, I was looking at these towers. Okay, this one looks good <laughs> and straight. That yeah, that one's like, got problems. This one looks like it's out of plumb. It's got some issues. <laughs> like, you know, they, they can adjust those guy wires and um, look at that, you know, with a straight edge. And yeah. this one, that looks horrible, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, they, they need to re re uh, tighten or rebalance their uh, guy wires. Do you think that looks bad? Look at the top section. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's Google, man. <laughs> that, looks like bad, that looks like a yeah. bad Photoshop job. <laughs> George is hitting the street maps. Yeah. <laughs> Bad stitch job. 68 degrees in Chicago as we approach 2 o'clock in afternoon. I'm Robin Lewis. Here's what's coming up at 2.30 in your WVON News. WVON in Chicago. Uh, it's actually uh, Berwyn, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. 10,000 watts. One kilowatt at night. You would never hear them mm -hmm. at night here or in the day. But during the eclipse, I did. Mm -hmm. That's not much signal to be hearing this far away. And it, it happened at 1900. I would have thought being way up here, you know. But George, is that like docting? Like it's a temperature inversion no, or something happening? Uh, not on these frequencies. It's, it's just like sky wave. Skip, okay. You know, it's just hitting the atmosphere and bouncing. And it happened at 1900. 1900, you know, would have been way back down here in... Okay. Look at that perfect omnidirectional pattern at night, and for only a thousand watts. And you see how big they're drawing it. Yeah, that is not realistic. You know, a lot no. of these patterns are sixteen ninety. That's in the expanded band. Turn the radio on, Mike. See if you can hear it. It's right there, covering you right up. That one, I'm gonna say, was probably my biggest surprise. I I, I wouldn't have thought I would have picked that up. I couldn't get WLS with 50,000 watts, but I did pick up this, this station at 10,000. Here's their uh, transmitter site. These neat-looking little towers. Yeah. Four, and they're not that tall. Of course, 1690, they would be shorter. Yeah. Are they freestanding? Yep. Yeah. See. It looks well. I don't see guy wires, but they don't mean anything. No, they are freestanding. You know, yeah, they're less it's... than 200 feet. It's almost in a 60, uh, 160 meter band. Yeah. That's pretty and awesome to be self supporting for that kind of height. Yeah. I've never we, really seen, and, and you notice they taper that, well, of course, at the bottom, but right up here, you know, it tapers and gets smaller. That would make a nice ham antenna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love to have that tower, but then I'd have to find somebody willing to climb it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Marty was asking in the chat room. How do you find those antenna patterns? Well, it's right here. It's at nf8m.com. Let's just 
look at night. We were talking about why they had those patterns like that. Let's look at 620. This is WJDX, the station I used to work at. You can't really see the pattern. There, There's part of it. But you see all of these, and they're all turned so that they're, they're minimizing signal toward other people on those frequencies. Right. Some of the big stations overlap others. But, but there's JDX right there. It's, it's two ears coming out either side and then a big lobe coming down this way. Now, in reality, no, it didn't have that good of coverage, but that was the the pattern let's look at another one here at a thousand watts all of these stations Whoa. are a thousand watts yeah day and night they're just all over the top of each other boy oh boy there's some frequencies that that's it and you know the thousand watt stations and they just pack them in and that's not all the stations i got i had a number more but the, you know we Run way over all. You're already going to have fun time editing this one. Yeah, I'm not. So you're going to send them into Hamside then? Hamside. Um, yeah. Tommy, I've gotten kind of hungry. We've been sitting here so long. Yeah. I think we got a package. Need a snack? I do. Oh, I see Arnie. Yeah. yeah. It yes. was WABG. Got a package here from uh, K5ARN. Arnie in the chat room. Let's see. Looks like somebody's been peeping in here. Somebody, I think somebody may have peeped in there. I don't make sure there wasn't any Doritos in there. SA7CAR. Oh, peaches. Five years later, maybe these taste better. 7-3. <laughs> K5ARN. Did you get Swedish fish? No, it's no, not. they're... Uh, yeah, I was trying to get around. Oh, there. Haribo. Peaches. peaches. Peach slices, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Or as we like to call them, fuzzy peach slices. Yeah, well, these, I bet let's, these are good. Let's try them. All right. It could be a trick. Think they're salty peaches? They look a lot better than... No, they're... The uh, they'll give you a sugar rush, that's for sure. Pretty tasty. Arnie? <laughs> Thanks, man. Those are those are good. They one. taste like peaches. Yeah, sure. those are really yeah. good. They're not salty at all. <laughs> no. Yeah, those are real good. Thanks, mm -hmm. Arnie. That looks like a premium hubby uh Bucky's fair. We got a post in our uh, Ozone Amateur Radio Club Facebook page about uh, a special event station that's happening here for the super cheap Louisiana purchase that happened way back when. And uh, it looks like it's going to be running from April 20th on um, uh, 7 p.m. our time all the way through the 28th um, at 7 p.m. our time. So uh, pretty cool. I'll have to see if anybody uh, wants to buy Louisiana again. Huh. So, so that that uh, phrase about I've got some swamp land I want to sell you, <laughs> as, a as a result of the Louisiana purchase. That's right. Now it's Florida. Good night, Chip. Good night, everyone else. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're going to call it quits. I mean, it's almost. Or should we go on hours? until Ham College now? Let's go. I mean, it's so only let's go like while we're young. Another hour and ten minutes before tomorrow. I know, right? Roughly. Yeah. Seven three. Yep, seven yeah. three everybody. Seven three. It was overclass, overclass, <laughs> just like us. <laughs>